When you think of ancient mysteries, Egypt is usually your first thought. The mystery of the Giza Pyramid and other archaeological finds bring up a rich past that no one is sure how these giant monuments and artifacts were made or their purpose. Recently, new discoveries have added to the mysteries around the world and often generate more questions than answers. Did aliens help mankind with mathematics and building ancient stone structures? Or is man himself more genius than we thought? Archaeologists in Egypt have unearthed more than 100 delicately painted wooden coffins, some with mummies inside, and 40 funeral statues in the ancient burial ground of Saqqara. It's the greatest discovery find in 2020. The sealed wooden coffins, some contain mummies, date as far back as 2,500 years and are in perfect condition of preservation. The fine quality of the coffins meant that they were probably the final resting places for the wealthiest citizens. Other artifacts discovered include funeral masks, canacopic jars, and amulets. This discovery is very important because it proves that Saqqara was the main burial of the 26th dynasty. It would also enrich existing knowledge about mummifications in that period. Saqqara a city about 20 miles south of Cairo is a vast acropolis of the Old Kingdom capital of Memphis, and it has long been the source of major archaeological finds. The necropolis holds more than a dozen burial sites, including the Steppe Pyramid of King Djoser, the first known burial pyramid. Experts opened a coffin and scanned a mummy with an x-ray, determining that it most likely was a man about the age of 40. More discoveries are predicted at the site. The latest discovery comes as Egypt is making a concerted effort to draw visitors back to the country, which depends heavily on tourism. Political problems, including a 2011 uprising that toppled the longtime leader, coupled with terrorist attacks and other instability, have deterred tourists, as well as the recent coronavirus pandemic. Made of black granite, the largest ancient Egyptian sarcophagus ever discovered in Alexandria has lain unopened for more than 2,000 years. And no one knows quite who or what lies inside. 
The discovery of the black sarcophagus beneath a modern Alexandria street is causing speculation in Egypt and beyond, with some even suggesting it might be the long-lost tomb of Alexander the Great. Speculation has only been intensified by the fact those who discovered the sarcophagus also found the carved alabaster bust of a man's head that was probably created to represent the tomb's occupant. This carved alabaster head was found near the sarcophagus. Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities revealed the six-foot-tall sarcophagus was discovered underground by archaeologists inspecting a building site in Alexandria's City Gaber district. The head of the council's ancient Egyptian antiquity sector says a layer of mortar between the lid and the rest of the sarcophagus showed the object had not been opened since it was closed in antiquity. Officials say the tomb is from a period which ended with the death of Cleopatra in 30 BC and began in 323 BC when Alexander the Great died and was eventually succeeded as ruler of Egypt by his Macedonian Greek general. The possible dating of such a large tomb to the period around Alexander's death has led to social media speculation the sarcophagus might be the final resting place of the general and empire builder. If that is the case, the contents of the black sarcophagus would solve one of the most enduring mysteries of antiquity. Despite his huge historical importance as the founder of one of the largest empires the world has ever seen, stretching from Greece to modern-day Pakistan, Alexander's final resting place has never been definitively pinpointed. There have been at least 140 attempts to locate Alexander's final tomb, and none of the claims to have found it has been universally accepted. If, therefore, the most optimistic speculation turns out correct and the unusually large black granite sarcophagus is proved to be the tomb of Alexander, it would arguably be the archaeological find of the century. These are recent discoveries that fall within modern recorded history. But what of the ancient past and many of the mysteries discovered that appear to have no explanation? Despite the mummies, statues, and engravings that the ancient Egyptians left behind, there is still more controversy over just what exactly they looked like. One thing's for certain, though. Despite what you might think about them given Hollywood's whitewashing of Egyptians, the residents of ancient Egypt were not white. According to Egyptologists, they were probably a range of colors, and neither white nor black by our contemporary standings. Ancient Egypt was a radically diverse place because the Nile River drew people from all over the region. Egyptian writings do not suggest that the people of that era had a preoccupation with skin color. Those who obeyed the king, spoke the language, and worshipped the proper gods were considered Egyptian. Ancient Egypt's massive pyramids are another element of their legacy that has long puzzled the experts. Just how exactly did a society with no modern construction equipment managed to transport the giant heavy stones needed to build the enormous pyramids. According to recent research by physicists at the University of Amsterdam, part of the answer may be wet sand. It turns out that wetting Egyptian desert sand can reduce the friction by quite a bit, which implies you only need half of the people to pull a sledge on wet sand. 
compared to dry sand. An ancient wall painting also seems to depict Egyptians wetting the sand as they pulled the sledge bearing a giant statue, offering more evidence that water may have been part of the arduous and complicated process of building the ancient pyramids. However, the pyramids themselves contain more mysteries that simply using wet sand would not allow them to accomplish as much. The Khufu Pyramid, the largest of the three pyramids at Giza, may actually contain some hidden secrets. A 2015 thermal scan of the Great Pyramid indicated that there were thermal anomalies within the structure, though it's unclear what exactly that means. A statement released about the results of the scans said the anomalies could mean many things. To explain such anomalies, a lot of hypotheses and possibilities could be drawn up. The presence of voids behind the surface, internal air currents, and more. There could even be an as yet undiscovered hidden tomb, but the project hasn't drawn any conclusions yet. In October 2016, researchers with Scan Pyramids, a group that uses methods such as X-rays and thermography, uncovered evidence of two possible new chambers within the pyramid, one behind the pyramid's north face and one more behind its descending corridor. This seems to confirm what robots had been noticing for a while, that there's more to the pyramid than just those three rooms. Since 1993, several small robots have entered the pyramid to learn what's in there, and they've come back with mysterious images of tunnels no one had seen since they built the pyramid 4,500 years back. Though these tunnels are likely too small to be of any use, it did suggest that there may be more hidden areas in the pyramid than we thought. And thanks to scanned pyramids, that thought may prove to be correct. If there are two more rooms, how many others are there? Are there rooms divided into subrooms? Until we do more testing, possibly with more robots, we truly don't know. Conventional Egyptologists will tell you the Giza Pyramid was built over years by thousands of worker slaves using the most basic tools. On the offset, this seems plausible, but when we dig deeper into the mystery of the pyramid, we find things that simply could not have been done with simple tools. The Egyptian pyramids, their most famous creations, were masterpieces built with such precision that our current technology cannot replicate it. Pyramids were not originally built to serve as tombs. They were built to preserve scientific knowledge for future use and understanding, some say. The giant pyramid of Giza is the most accurately aligned structure in existence and faces true north with only 3 60th of a degree of error. The position of the North Pole moves over time and the pyramid was exactly aligned to true north at one time. At 481 feet, Archaeologists say the Great Pyramid was the tallest structure in the world for about 3,800 years. Engineers estimate the structure to be composed of around 2,300,000 stone blocks, 
and the highly skilled workers would have had to set one of the 2.5 to 15 ton blocks every two and a half minutes to finish Khufu's pyramid in the 30 years it took to build it. The mortar used is stronger than stone and is still holding up today. It has been analyzed and its chemical composition is known but can't be reproduced. One of the more fascinating aspects of the Giza pyramid has nothing to do with the pyramid itself. It's the fact that the pyramids appear on almost every continent around the planet. Pyramids are so common that one wonders where the idea for this shape came from. Most scholars would answer that the world's many pyramids are the product of coincidence and convergence, peoples of different cultures imitating forms in nature, such as the mountains of Mexico or the sand dunes of Egypt. But is this the final word on the subject? Is it an oversimplification? Could it be that pyramids around the globe share a common cultural heritage? As much as they symbolize the mystery and magic of ancient Egypt, pyramids are not uniquely Egyptian. Pyramids of various sorts all appear in the ancient African kingdom of Kush, along the Nile between the third and fourth cataracts, as ziggurats in ancient Mesopotamia and Samaria. In England and Ireland, taking on such forms as Silbury Hill and New Grange in India, and throughout Southeast Asia in the distinct style of the Buddhist stupa and Angkor Wat in medieval Cambodia, at Indonesia's Borobudur in ancient China, at Teotihuacan and other sites in the Valley of Mexico, in the ancient Olmec and Mayan realms of Southern Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, and El Salvador, along the Mississippi at Cahokia and other ceremonial centers. And in Peru's coastal region, among the people who were the ancestors of the ancient empire and in that country's northern Andes, the Inca heartland. All of these cultures used this shape and no one knows why. Surely there had to be some connection with each culture to share the idea of the pyramid shape. The shape itself may be telling in that perhaps ancient people discovered something powerful about this design. In ancient days, it would have been much easier and faster to simply build square or block buildings as we do today. But nothing in these cultures appears to be easy. Balancing the rocks to form this shape would have been difficult, and then there is the alignment of the pyramids themselves. Simply moving the blocks from their quarry, sometimes miles away, and then placing them would have been a monumental task in and of itself. Placing them to form this shape and yet keeping with an alignment with stars and astrology would have further exasperated the effort. So why were ancient people around the globe so focused on building something that was so difficult? What was their motivation? And why did all these cultures decide to do this? The Cahokia Mounds State Historic Site is the site of a pre-Columbian Native American city which existed around 1050 to 1350 CE directly across the Mississippi River from modern St. Louis, Missouri. 
This historic park lies in southwestern Illinois between East St. Louis and Collinsville. The park covers 2,200 acres, or about 3.5 square miles, and contains about 80 mounds. But the ancient city was much larger, and its apex around 1100 CE, the city covered about 6 square miles and included about 120 man-made earthen mounds in a wide range of sizes, shapes, and functions. At the apex of its population, Cahokia may have briefly exceeded contemporaneous London, which at that time was approximately 14,000 to 18,000 people. Cahokia was the largest and most influential urban settlement of the Mississippi culture, which developed advanced societies across much of what is now the central and southeastern United States, beginning more than 1,000 years before European contact. Today, Cahokia Mounds is considered the largest and most complex archaeological site north of the great pre-Columbian cities in Mexico. Though it is called Cahokia today, no one knows what its original name was. The city's complex construction of earthen mounds required evacuation, movement by hand using woven baskets, and construction involving 55 million cubic feet of earth, much of which was accomplished over a matter of just decades. Its highly planned ceremonial plazas, situated around the mounds with homes for thousands, connected by laid-out pathways and courtyards, suggest the location served as a central religious pilgrimage city. It would have been easy for the natives to carry dirt and form the mounds, many with pyramid-like shapes. But still, the motivation for doing so is in question. Nothing is known of the original builders of the site, as they had no written records. So the question remains, who or what influenced them to construct these mounds, which would spread throughout the Americas? Further south in the Americas is the Pyramid of the Sun. It is the largest building in Teotihuacan and one of the largest in Mesoamerica. It's believed to have been constructed about 200 AD. Found along the Avenue of the Dead with the Pyramid of the Moon, the pyramid is part of a large complex in the heart of the city. The name Pyramid of the Sun comes from the Aztecs who visited the city of Teotihuacan centuries after it was abandoned. The name given to the pyramid by the Teotihuacanos is unknown. It was constructed in two phases. The first construction stage around 200 CE brought the pyramid to nearly the size it is today. The second round of construction resulted in its completed size of 738 feet across and 246 feet high, making it the third largest pyramid in the world, though still just over half the height of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The second phase also saw the construction of an altar atop of the pyramid, which has not survived into modern times. Over the structure, the ancient Teotihuacanos finished their pyramid with lime plaster imported from surrounding areas on which they painted brilliantly colored murals. While the pyramid has endured for centuries, the paint and plaster have not and are no longer visible. Jaguar heads and paws, stars and snake rattles are among the few images associated with the pyramids.
It is thought that the pyramid venerated a deity within Teotihuacan society. However, little evidence exists to support this hypothesis. The destruction of the temple on top of the pyramid by both deliberate and natural forces prior to the archaeological study of the site has so far prevented identification of the pyramid with any particular deity. The pyramid was built on a carefully selected spot from where it was possible to align it both to the north and in perpendicular directions to sunrises and sunsets on specific dates recorded by a number of archaeological orientations in Mesoamerica. The whole central part of the urban grid of Teotihuacan, including the Avenue of the Dead, reproduces the orientation of the Sun Pyramid, while the southern part exhibits a slightly different orientation dictated by the Culedulea. The pyramid was built over a man-made tunnel leading to a cave located 19 feet down beneath the center of the structure. Originally, this was believed to be a naturally formed lava tube and interpreted as possibly the place of Chikomoztak, the place of human origin, according to Nahu legends. More recent excavations have suggested that the space is man-made and could have served as a royal tomb. Recently, scientists have used muon detectors to try to find other chambers within the interior of the pyramid. Looting has prevented the discovery of a function for the chambers in Teotihuacan society. Though many have associated Mayan, Aztec, and Toltec beliefs to the site, the truth is no one knows why it was built for whom or even the actual culture that built it. No one knows its actual name. Remember, its modern name was given to it by the Teotihuacanos and accepted by the Aztecs. If we travel further south into South America, things get even more mysterious. South America has its version of pyramids and odd monoliths as well. Much of it makes no sense to our modern world view. For example, Saskatchewan, Peru. This fortress constructed just outside of the former Inca capital of Cusco is the subject of much debate. Based on the tight fit of each of the heavy stones making up the structures in this area, archaeologists and other scientists are stumped as to how this was done. Tools excavated from the quarries, such as hammers, chisels, and metal bars, suggest the boulders were shaped by sheer strength and exact measurements. Though it is certainly reasonable to wonder if the stones are all hand-carved or hammered into shape, others believe the sides of the stones were heated to a melting point, then fitted into place next to boulders which had already cooled. Now, this theory would mean the Incas had a way to heat the boulders to over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the builders had some kind of power saws and drills to cut the blocks. A third hypothesis is that a plant existed at the time that had a chemical property that would soften stone. British archaeologist Lieutenant Colonel Perry Fawcett, who was ridiculed by scientists for claiming to have seen and shot a 62-foot-long anaconda, detailed an experience with such a chemical during an expedition to Peru and Bolivia. 
He noted finding a jar with unknown contents that, when broken, changed the consistency of the rock it spilled on to wet cement. If a plant with such properties existed, it would certainly make shaping the stone faster and easier than chiseling a solid foundation. Archaeologists have determined that Sesquasahuman was originally built by the preceding Kilike culture. Beginning about the 13th century, the Inca expanded on this monumental construction. So again, though claimed by the Inca, no one is sure who actually started its construction. Today, only the stones that were too large to be easily moved remain at the site. In March of 2008, archaeologists discovered additional ruins at the periphery of the Sisquatchahuan. They are believed to have been built by an earlier culture, which preceded the Inca. While appearing to be ceremonial in nature, the exact function remains unknown. This culture built structures and occupied the site for hundreds of years before the Inca, between 900 and 1200 CE. In January of 2010, parts of the site were damaged during periods of heavy rainfall in the region. Perhaps most famous in South America are the Nazca Lines in Peru. The Nazca Lines were designated in 1994 as a UNESO World Heritage Site. A series of enormous lines and symbols etched into the ground and estimated to be 1,500 to 2,000 years old. These precise drawings have been a mystery since their discovery in the early 1900s. The Nazca people, not to be confused with the Incas, were also very religious and much of their livelihood was dependent upon growing crops. Some speculate these images and symbols could have been created as offerings to the gods to garner favor for them for good crops. Marie Reich, who spent over half her life studying and mapping the lines, theorized these were created as a mental exercise to show off the Nazca command of geometry. Another hypothesis says that the lines could have been a predecessor to the Inca Q system, which designated a series of ritual pathways and marked sacred ground. And of course, one of the most famous guesses is that some of the long straight lines were cut into the ground by landing spaceships from other planets. But these are guesses and hypotheses. Because the region sees very little rainfall and the rocks and dirt of the area were used to make the lines, no one really knows who made them or why. They can't be carbon dated. They could be 2,000 years old or 10,000 years old, or even older. We have a lot of assumptions and very few actual answers as to why the people of this area, who were not Incan, made these lines. We have no idea what their purpose was, what motivated them, why design symbols, images of animals, and straight lines like runways that can only be seen and appreciated from the air. Many scoff at the idea that these were made by or meant for aliens. Perhaps they were, perhaps not. But can you think of any reason to create such a display if not for someone who could fly? Titicaca in Peru and Bolivia is the 
highest navigable lake in the world. Lake Titicaca is a natural border between Peru and Bolivia. According to Andean legends, this lake was the birthplace of the Incas, whose spirits would return to the lake after death. About 17 years ago, the ruins of a temple were found deep in the lake. Estimated to predate the Incas, a terrace for crops, a road, and a 2,600 foot long wall were also found by archaeologists over the span of 200 dives. Continued research in 2013 also recovered several artifacts from different eras. The existence of these underwater discoveries could be explained by old legends of massive floods and torrential rain. Many stories attributed the disasters as retribution from the gods. Though scientists, archaeologists, and historians consider the cause of the overflow to be allegorial, research suggests flooding did change the water level in the lake and force the inhabitants to relocate. Think about that. There is an entire city under this lake. It was not built by the Incas. At least that we know is true. So who built it? Legend says it is the birthplace of the Incans. So that culture perhaps formed here, but was not here when it was built. Someone else built it. Someone or some culture that predates the Incans, and they discovered it already intact and simply claimed it. Who were these people? They built a 2,600 foot wall and terraces for crops. They must have been sophisticated. They had roads. We today consider the Romans as the inventor of roads, but this culture had them too. The answer to many of these questions is sitting at the bottom of a lake in Peru and Bolivia. We have no idea what else awaits discovery in this lake. Nearby in Bolivia is the ancient city of Pumapunku. The city of Tawanaku in western Bolivia is said to be where Lord Viroca created the world. One of the world's ancient mysteries, Pumapunku, predates the Inca. The intrigue of this site is in the complexity of the precise stonework found in the ruins. Detailed work such as meticulous carvings and exact interlocking stone pieces with no chisel or tool marks to be found have researchers scratching their heads. The site also holds a complex irrigation system with holes drilled so perfectly into the stone their creation and endurance is nothing short of wondrous. Here we find an engineering marvel. Precision so sophisticated our modern lasers and machinery would be hard pressed to replicate. Not that we couldn't do it, we can. But the question is, how did they do it? They had no lasers that we know of. They had simple copper tools and chisels, so we're told. They created precise interlocking blocks that fit together like Legos. They built an entire complex this way. They had a complex irrigation system, and again, they predated the Incas. So who were they? We don't know. Also located in Tiwanuka, in Porto del Sol, Bolivia, what is left of the Gate of the Sun stands among ruins and dates back to 14,000 BC according to some researchers. 
nearly 10 feet tall and carved from a single stone, it is estimated to weigh about 10 tons. When discovered in the 19th century by explorers, the giant stone was cracked and lying on its side. Now it has been re-erected where it was found, but is believed that that is not its original site. The original location of this megalith is unknown. Being a later monument to the site in which it stands, the Gateway of the Sun could have also represented a transition from lunar religion to solar religion based on its positioning to the sun to the west. The carvings on the stone led some to believe this monument was used as a calendar to mark the passage of time. Others believe the symbols hold astronomical connotations. Based on the images carved into the stone, many believe this could have once been a portal to another dimension or some kind of stargate to other planets. The Andean civilizations did not leave written records other than fiber recordings of their religious belief system. Because of this, researchers have had to rely on the Spanish who documented the Incas following their conquest of the empire. The Incas themselves had trained memorizers who were responsible for providing history through the oral traditions which the Spanish chroniclers used for their records. References to sky beings and other celestial persons were often cited in their chronicling. Perhaps this was a doorway to the heavens, or a portal, as some believe. The Olmec colossal heads are stone representations of human heads sculpted from large basalt boulders. They range in height from 3.8 to 11.2 feet. The heads date from at least 900 BC and are a distinctive feature of the Olmec civilization of ancient Mesoamerica. All portray mature individuals with fleshy cheeks, flat noses, and slightly crossed eyes. Their physical characteristics correspond to a type that is still common among the inhabitants of Tabasco and Veracruz. The backs of the monuments often are flat. The boulders were brought from the Sierra de los Tuclas Mountains of Veracruz. Given that the extremely large slabs of stone used in their production were transported over large distances, 93 miles, required a great deal of human effort and resources. It's thought that the monuments represent portraits of powerful individual Olmec rulers. Each of the known examples has a distinctive headdress. The heads were variously arranged in lines or groups at major Olmec centers, but the method and logistics used to transport the stone to these sites remains unclear. They all display distinctive headgear, and one theory is that these were worn as protective helmets, maybe worn for war or to take part in a ceremonial Mesoamerican ball game. The colossal heads cannot be precisely dated. However, some heads were buried by 9000 BC, indicating that their period of manufacture and use was still earlier. Some heads had been moved from their original context before they were investigated by archaeologists, and the heads from La Venta were found partially exposed on the modern ground surface. The period of production of the colossal heads is therefore unknown, as is whether it spanned a century or a millennium.
The exact method of transportation of such large masses of rock are unknown, especially since the Olmecs lacked beasts of burden and functional wheels, and they were likely to have used water transport when possible. Coastal currents of the Gulf of Mexico and river estuaries might have made the waterborne transport of monuments weighing 20 tons uh, more than impractical. When transport over land was necessary, the Olmecs are likely to have used causeways, ramps, and roads to facilitate moving the heads. The regional terrain, however, offers significant obstacles such as swamps and floodplains. Avoiding these would have necessitated crossing undulating hill country. So, how did they get them there? 93 miles is a long way to move several ton stones, and given the type of land they would have had to cover, it would make this a monumental task. But the stones are there, and this culture may not have had the means to move them. Earth structures such as mounds, platforms, and causeways upon the plateau demonstrate that the Olmec possessed the necessary knowledge and could commit the resources to build large-scale earthworks. But moving and creating these finely crafted stones may not have been within their abilities. If not, then who did? Who created and moved these stones for them? Throughout man's study of ancient cultures, we have asked three questions. Who, how, and when? Some may say it's a huge leap to ascribe the answers to these questions to aliens, and they would be within their right to do so. But when faced with the obvious, one can only speculate that these cultures may have had help of some kind. Some would suggest they must have. So let us entertain the idea. We will start with who. Who helped them? There are two possibilities. One is, of course, the idea that aliens came to Earth and helped early civilization to create monuments, sculptures, and giant buildings using their own advanced mathematics and technology. If so, then these simple humans would have thought those beings were gods, and there is evidence this is the case. It may be that the whole of our civilization began with a cargo cult, a people who watched advanced beings do such wondrous things that to this very day our gods of modern and antiquity are based on them. One can easily say that the evidence for this is scattered like so much litter around the planet. For this theory to work, we must assume two things. The artifacts we discovered is far older than believed, and all cultures had one single original event that was shared around the world. For example, pyramids are common because all cultures witnessed them being built. A technology existed that made moving heavy objects much easier, even easier than our modern technology is capable of. And also that some of these monuments were early attempts to replicate what we as a people witnessed ourselves being done by the aliens. In the 1940s and 50s, cargo cults emerged on islands in the Pacific by people who witnessed airplanes flying and landing and the humans who boarded them that gave them food and other delicacies. The islanders, so impressed with this ability, built straw models of airplanes and held long vigils to try to entice the gods to return. They used the only technologies they knew to try and replicate what they had seen, mud and straw effigies. The paltry attempts to replicate an airplane look almost comical, 
but the desire behind their creation was phenomenal. These people witnessed man flying, something they could never do, never even conceive of, and would never try. Then they saw it, and suddenly it became possible to them. It changed their entire perspective, and thus they emulated it. Is it possible that the Bent Pyramid of Egypt was an attempt to emulate the Giza Pyramid by a later culture that discovered it, or even rows of rocks in labyrinth patterns were man's attempt to draw something he had witnessed? These patterns remain today. These attempts are still being discovered, along with the monumental creations they're based on that seem impossible to exist. Piling up rocks and dirt mounds is one thing. Moving 50 ton or more blocks and laying them precisely into place is yet another. So some of the ancient sites we know of may simply be our feeble attempts to replicate something witnessed being done. And some of the monuments and creations around the world may indeed be the very designs of those who left them here. Is it possible that we as a civilization were influenced by another, perhaps outside of our solar system? Of course it is, but that may not be the only explanation. Another second answer to who may have originated right here on Earth and had nothing to do with aliens. It is entirely possible that some of the monuments modern man has discovered were created by a culture that predates mankind, a civilization before our own. And that civilization may have been far more advanced than we can imagine. The Silurian Hypothesis is a thought experiment which accesses modern science's ability to detect evidence of a prior advanced civilization, perhaps several million years ago. Since fossilization is relatively rare and little of Earth's exposed surface is from before the Quaternary, the chances of finding direct evidence of such a civilization, such as technological artifacts, is small. After a great time span, researchers concluded contemporary humans would be more likely to find indirect evidence, such as anomalies in the chemical composition or isotope ratios of sediments, objects that could indicate possible evidence of past civilizations, includes plastics and nuclear wastes, residues buried deep underground or on the ocean floor. Prior civilizations could have gone to space and left artifacts on other celestial bodies, such as the Moon and Mars. Evidence for artifacts on these two worlds would be easier to find than on Earth, where erosion and tectonic activity would erase much of it. Any plastic or artificially created technology would be long gone, including paper and data storage devices. But the presence of advanced technology might be evident in stone structures, which would erode at a much slower rate. Is it possible that what we see in many of these ancient artifacts is the result of a much more advanced civilization that predates man? The ability to move and position large stone blocks would seem impossible for ancient man and very difficult for modern man with our technology. But these monuments, buildings, and out-of-place artifacts do exist. They are scattered around the planet like so much leftover litter that is eroding even today, but were built to last at some point in antiquity.
Many of these monuments are claimed by ancient human and modern cultures, but even they can't explain them. Returning to Egypt and looking closely at the Giza pyramids and surrounding areas, engineers have found the presence of advanced technology and construction that boggles the mind. The pyramid itself is a monument to advanced architecture, but nearby we find blocks that have laser-like cuts and holes no simple civilization could have mastered. Within the pyramid, there are blocks so huge and so precisely placed that even with our modern cranes and lifting machines, we would have a hard time trying to lay them so accurately. Could we do it? Of course. But we today are an advanced civilization with tools capable of precision and delicate work as well as heavy construction. The ancient Egyptians had no such tools and no access to them. So, what if the Giza Pyramid and the nearby Sphinx were not created by the Egyptians? What if they predate even that ancient culture and were built by someone else, a civilization that is much older than them? Modern Egyptologists scoff at the idea because it's important to their modern culture to lay claim to these monuments. It means tourism dollars for them. Naturally, they need to weave a story that places themselves as the intelligence that made these marvels. We do not have the technology to date rocks. We can only date organic materials because they emit isotopes at a consistent rate. We simply cannot determine the age of the blocks. Our estimates of age is based mostly on modern and ancient cultures' descriptions of them when they laid claim to them, and primarily we date the pyramids by their position in the development of Egyptian architecture and material culture over the broad sweep of 3,000 years. The Nile, many centuries ago, was a rich and fertile land. Now and throughout antiquity, it has been a desert and the pyramids themselves were once covered in sand. Is it possible that the Giza Pyramid was discovered by the culture we now call the Egyptians and not created by them? Our modern estimate for the age of the Sphinx is 4,514 years old. Modern scientists say it's exciting to contemplate the existence of an unknown civilization that predates the ancient Egyptians, but most archaeologists and geologists still favor the traditional view that the Sphinx is about 4,500 years old. Colin Reeder, an English geologist who independently conducted a more recent survey of the enclosure, assumes the various quarries on the site have been excavated around the causeway. Because these quarries are known to have been used by Khufu, Reeder concludes that the causeway and the temples on either end thereof must predate Khufu thereby casting doubt on the conventional Egyptian chronology. The Orion Correlation Theory, as expounded by popular author Graham Hancock, is based on proposed exact correlations of the three pyramids at Giza with the three stars Zeta Orionis, Epsilon Orionis, and Delta Orionis, the stars forming Orion's belt, in the relative positions occupied by these stars at about 10,500 BC. The author argues that the geographic relationship of the Sphinx, the Giza pyramids, and the Nile directly corresponds with Leo, Orion, and the Milky Way, respectively. The Sphinx water erosion hypothesis 
contends that the main type of weathering evident on the enclosure walls of the Great Sphinx could only have been caused by prolonged and extensive rainfall and must therefore predate the time of the pharaohs. Colin Reeder, a British geologist, studied the erosion patterns and noticed that they are found predominantly on the western enclosure wall and not on the Sphinx itself. He proposed the rainfall water runoff hypothesis which also recognizes climate change transitions in the area. There is a long history of speculation about hidden chambers beneath the Sphinx by esoteric figures such as H. Spencer Lewis. Edgar Cayce specifically predicted in the 1930s that a hall of records containing knowledge from Atlantis would be discovered under the Sphinx in 1998. His prediction fueled much of the fringe speculation that surrounded the Sphinx in the 1990s, which lost momentum when the hall was not found when predicted. All of these theories are based on observations of the Sphinx, but no one has been allowed to drill or uncover anything that may be within the statue. It's possible that either underneath or within the statue itself could lie clues to its origin. Seismic readings indicate that there are chambers underneath the Sphinx. These, however, have been determined to be naturally formed cavities, even though no one has been allowed to drill or enter these cavities. The Egyptian authority responsible for ancient monuments has forbidden any further detonation or drilling, so at best these are educated guesses. We know the Sphinx was discovered buried in sand during the Egyptian times, and again in more modern times. It has been buried perhaps multiple times in history. Therefore, it is plausible that it was discovered by, but not created by known ancient cultures. The truth is, we have no idea. We have theories that fit accepted historical accounts, many of which do not fit the scientific evidence that is available and may be available to us within the structure. Astronomical alignments are also an important way of determining when a structure was built or put into place. The direction of the monument will usually align with a star pattern because in ancient times people observed the stars and placed significance on them. It's relatively easy to back up the clock and see where stars were located in the heavens at specific dates. Some historians have thrown doubt on the ancient Egyptians ever having built the Great Pyramids of Giza, instead claiming the monuments could have been built by a lost civilization. The authors of a book investigating the only remaining wonder of the ancient world thrown doubt on conventional thinking that it was the ancient Egyptians that built the Pyramids of Giza around 2500 BC. Instead, Gary Cannon and Malcolm Hutton claim that the Sphinx in front of the pyramids must have been carved out of a natural rock and long before any sand covered the area, meaning that at one time long ago the area must have been fertile. When it was not under sand was about 12,000 years ago and the Egyptians weren't there. This would mean, according to the pair's research, the pyramids and sphinx were built at least 12,500 years ago, which would have been before the start of the Ice Age. Conventional thinking about when the pyramids of Giza were built date construction to between 2,560 to 2,540 BC, a difference of around 10,000 years. The Egyptians couldn't have done it. They didn't have the tools, says historian Gary Cannon. Although not completely convinced, he does believe it could have been by the hands of the people of the advanced civilization of Atlantis that was ultimately consumed by flooding. 
His idea is that there was some advanced civilization that came to the planet tens of thousands of years ago. This of course presupposes that Atlantis was an alien culture. He did research and suggests there's a direct line from the pyramids to a submerged continent within a seamount and on the seamount there are two pinnacles that look like pyramids. It's possible when Atlantis sunk they went to another place, probably Egypt, and they had the technology to build those pyramids. There's no one else that could have done it. We don't have the technology, he says. Nobody knows who was there 12,000 years ago. The three smaller pyramids at Giza probably were built by the Egyptians as they could be built by man. But it's impossible that the three bigger ones were, simply from the size of them. They've got 2,250,000 blocks in them, and each block weighs about 250 tons. We couldn't even move it with all of the equipment we have today, so he postulates that it had to have been done by a civilization that was more advanced than any of us. However, the word of Mr. Cannon and others who have raised doubts regarding the Egyptians building the pyramids have been met with a brick wall by the Egyptian authorities who maintain the ancient Egyptians built them. Mr. Cannon said, The Egyptians have their blinkers on and they won't even look at anything else because all of their work, all of their books, all of their history will be thrown out the window and they are all against anyone who says anything different. If a pre-civilization to mankind did exist, how advanced were they? We like to imagine they may have had computers and electronics or space travel and advanced flight or anti-gravity. The reason for this is because we compare any civilization to our own modern way of life. A civilization can be advanced and not have any of these things or have technology that works completely different from the way we view it today. For example, if Tesla rather than Edison had led the technology revolution after the turn of the century, how different would our current technology be? There would be no power lines crisscrossing our cities and neighborhoods. We would be bringing power to each home from within the air. Tesla invented or imagined a craft that would use power in the atmosphere to allow it to fly with no wings or propellers. Jet engines may never have been invented because we could have these saucers to fly in. Warfare would be different as well as energy weapons would have come to fruitation long ago and we may have even negated any need for nuclear power or bombs because we would have seen its inefficiency and pollution and adopted weapons that simply did not require splitting the atom. Radio communication such as cell phones would have appeared quickly rather than taking till the end of the 20th century to emerge. The internet would have come about early too or some form of data transmission through the air. With that one simple change, adopting Tesla's ideas, it would have changed the landscape of how our modern world works. Our advanced technology would be very different today. If a pre-civilization had a Tesla or other inventors who took their culture to very different directions, we might not even recognize it as advanced at all. Or it might have appeared so different we couldn't understand it, even with our own advancements in thinking and invention. The Giza Pyramid is an awesome structure, but what if it had some purpose, some function that allowed it to work more as a machine than a tomb? Egyptologists assume it was a tomb, though no sarcophagi or burial implements have ever been discovered inside it. In fact, there is no writing or instructions inside it at all. We think it was a tomb because within our cultural thinking, 
It's the only thing we can imagine it was used for. However, if technologies existed within this pre-civilization, completely different ways of doing things, it's not hard to see that its function may have fit perfectly within their way of doing things. The pyramid could have taken advantage of ley lines or some other natural energy. It could have been a healing device, a power station, or some kind of pump for all we know. We see the Giza Pyramid as a marvel of construction. However, its purpose may have been so benign as to make it just another structure within a vast and complex society. The reason why we see pyramids in all cultures around the globe may mean they were needed to distribute global energy or were healing devices for that society. They may have simply been the local hospital or power company. Because we have lost the entire context of which they were being used, and because we view them from our own cultural perspective, we have no idea how to truly understand them. As advanced as we are today, we're pretty much clueless. We use about 20% of our brains. What if they used more? They may have had an intellect far greater than our own, been able to tap into abilities we are only discovering today and used those qualities to benefit their way of life. When we invent something, that invention doesn't stand alone. It creates a pathway for more invention based on its use. The transistor led to the integrated circuit that led to adding more circuits together, miniaturization, and creating motherboards that then led to computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices. One invention begets another, and how we use these inventions together and apart create the advanced society we live in. A combination of inventions. A combination of electronics, rockets, fuel distillery, understanding flight, and other inventions led eventually to satellites and missions to the moon. We started with one invention, built on it, and eventually ended up where we are today. If a pre-civilization started at a different point or went in a different direction, then their society would be based on a completely different pathway that made them advanced much like us, but different. Their thinking would be different, their language would be different, their way of life would be different, and all of this would affect their society, culture, religions, science, and lifestyles. They would have been a completely alien civilization to us who took different paths. They may have never relied on rockets, never needed gasoline, never required wires or electronics like we have. When we need to build something, we either have to cut and shave blocks or bake bricks in the sun to create the materials to build things the way we are used to. They may have known how to melt rock, easily lift huge stones, flew overhead to design patterns on the ground, and communicate in ways far beyond our simple radio. Our society relies on technology. They may have seen technology as just another way of doing what they could do naturally, or as only a way to enhance their own abilities. The truth is, we are clueless. For all we know, their way may have been a better way. They may have lived simple lives because they didn't need gadgets and email to feel worthy or they could have been completely dependent on their technology, which may have led to their downfall and the reason much of their existence is hard to discover today. We simply don't know, and it's human arrogance to presume we know everything about them.
or that they may not have existed at all. But then there is that litter scattered about the planet, making us question, making us try to solve their mysterious presence. Who, how, and when are not easy questions. Sure, it's easy to simply slap a label on everything and just accept the status quo. We assume this, therefore this must be the way it was. We need to be ready to accept that there are possibilities that go beyond our own way of thinking. And just because we assume something cannot be true, doesn't mean it isn't. The ancient monuments around the world are not only marvels to study, but they are signposts to our past. And they tell a story of a rich history that mankind has lived through wonders we have seen, and perhaps peoples or even aliens we have learned from. We should make every effort to understand these signs and learn as much as we can by what we have discovered and what we will discover in the future. Perhaps one day we may find a secret vault with all the answers. Until then, Keep an open mind and show respect to our ancestors. After all, they are us and we are them. And we are an important factor in the universe.